So, we're going to pick the story up with the first of our big themes, having sort of learned a little bit of history. And that's language. Um, I did mention that language became central to the concerns of psychology, philosophy of mind, and cognitive science around this cognitivist turn in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, Chomsky's work sort of hit in the 1960s, really. Um, I've also headed this language and languaging. Languaging is a really ugly word, and I resisted it for a long time. I have grown to like it. I'm not going to force any of you to use it. It's a disgusting word. It's horrible, right? What, when we have a perfectly good word, which is language, what the hell do we mean by language? Well, what, what do you mean by language? There's a lovely quote attributed, I don't know if it's true, to Max Weinreich, which is, uh, Sprach is a dialect with an army and flot. A language is a dialect with an army and a navy. Of course, that just pushes the question back, what's a dialect? Um, nevertheless, linguists frequently talk of things like French and English as if they existed in the natural world. Now, when we do that, Let's already consider the, this contrast between a state-based eternalist sort of perspective, in which case you can talk about the history of English that arose here, it spread all over the world, it picked up various infections from every other language in the world, and that's why it's developed this weird spelling and weird richness. And, and you can talk about it, and you can talk about Irish, for example, Irish as being a language which is deeply intertwined with the history of the state. So it seems like we're talking about something real. Switch to a presentist perspective, and we're talking about a whole bunch of individual acts, a whole bunch of individual encounters. And there, the drawing, drawing a line between English and non-English, or Irish and non-Irish, is going to be almost impossible. You may think you're happy to meet that I'm speaking English now, but there are so many things that go by the name of English in this world, many of them mutually unintelligible, many of those encounters characterized by very much more than merely the words that we speak. Seriously, put someone with Glasgow together with someone with Kerry in a room and there's nothing, nothing's going to happen. They don't speak. Um, so what, whenever we believe that we know what language is, especially if we're going to use words like English and French, we're reifying. We're going beyond concrete particulars. Concrete particulars mean, for example, what's going on right here, right now. If you believe that you can abstract from this situation, peel off layers, leave most of the messiness of a specific context behind, and for example, write down the words that were used, then you've reified. And reification is necessary. We have to reify. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about English or French, but we should be aware of what we're doing when we talk about English or French. And the problem with language, and the reason that I, I'm, I'm suggesting the word languaging as well, is that it's not clear which concrete particulars we should select. So my biggest problem with Chomsky is that I don't believe he's even looking at language. But of course he would deny that. He's, he's looking at the difference between John kicked the ball and the ball John kicked and kicked John the ball and kicked ball John there. Some of which are English sentences, some of which are not English. And therefore, so you have used that word English as if that sort of identified something? And yet, where's John? Where's the ball? Who ever said such stupid sentences? Where's the context? Every sentence that's uttered among people is, is spoken in context. Right? It's motivated. Um, that particular syntactic way of looking at speech reifies enormously, peeling it off, peeling just those symbols, those ordered symbols off. And there's not more going on. However, nobody's got the right answer here. Everyone who wishes to treat of language as a system, for example, is going to have to identify some concrete particulars. And the study of language is very old. The connection between language and thought and experience is very, very old and has been the subject of extensive research in the Sanskrit tradition in India, going back thousands of years. Panini, one of the first grammarians, using language as, a, as an entry route into some of the mysteries that we would now think of as mind and experience. Um, but that's not a tradition that's continuous with the scientific tradition. The scientific treatment of language comes out of a, a European practice known as philology. There have always been experts about language, and they go back hundreds of years, but that expertise wasn't necessarily scientific expertise. We see the scientific method turned towards language as an object of study around the end of the 19th century, 
and with the rise of what we would call structuralism. And then we've already recognized that you know where this is coming after the Second World War, the cognitivist turn. We get cognitivism and generative linguistics, which are born together. And then as this theoretical diversity multiplies, we find more and more people interested in very many other aspects other than the symbol sequencing aspects, looking at things like tone of voice, like body language, like um, chanting. I study, I, I work as a linguist and I study chanting in this area. So it's, uh, there's all kinds of things you can look at. That's, so that's where languaging is put there. But let's just have a look at where, what that path was. So philology is an area of scholarly expertise. And there's been need for this without it being necessarily scientific. So for several thousand years, we've had the business of specialists who are capable of interpreting religious texts. Bibles, Qurans, Torahs, Talmuds, Vedas, Sutras. These texts require their interpretation, and there are people in any given society who have the authority to do so. In some traditions, that's a much greater authority than in others. Learning other languages. I just dared to question the existence of English and French. It doesn't mean that I can walk out of here and just walk into a bar in Thailand and order in Thai. I can't, unfortunately. So the business of bringing that knowledge to someone that they need to speak in the Farden is, uh, has given rise to the study of grammar, pedagogical grammars, for hundreds and hundreds of years. It goes together with the business of foreign language teaching, and of course that has become much more pervasive as forms of travel have opened up. There's also been the study of specific authors. So the rediscovery of the classics in the, in the Renaissance, for example, the Roman and Greek classics, led to a lot of scholarly expertise in treating of these manuscripts and these texts from ancient Greece, classical Greece and classical Rome. Um, and even within more recent times, certain texts tend to uh, draw more attention than others. We could also include in here something of this, the development of the study of law. Um, so philology is all these kinds of expertise together. The scholarly study of language and texts, including deciphering, learning to read hieroglyphics, the Rosetta Stone, all that business, interpreting, and historical analysis. So that's all great stuff, but it's, none of it is very scientific. We tend to associate the... Um, organization of a scientific discipline of language with this guy, Ferdinand de Saussure, who did most of his work in the second half of the 19th century. He's a Swiss chap, chap and he's a brilliant writer. Um, and what he did was he, he took the hitherto unordered domain of language and he brought this organizing intelligence to it. He peeled off some things and left others behind, as anybody studying language must. He was more self-conscious in doing so than many people are. And he distinguished between long, which is the abstract system he wants to study, his reification, if you will, and parole, which is the words actually spoken in any given context. The messy business full of speech errors and hesitations and so on. This is a framework with which you can birth this whole systematic study of language, and it maps well onto the idea of discrete languages of English versus French versus uh, Japanese, for example. And so you can, you can begin, you, when you have this, you can start talking of the English noun system, or the French, uh, morpho mor French morphology, or Japanese phonemes, Japanese vowels, for example. This is a systematicity, and it's very much of its time the end of the 19th century, in very many disciplines, science, as we've noted, was really taking off. And that means, kind of in parallel with the way we have today, we, there was more data than theories. There was more observations than theories. And what was needed was some way of organizing all this. These days we would call this a big data problem. Um, so Sir hoped that if you got away from the messy business of everyday use, you could identify a system that was structured and that could be formally characterized. And I'd just like to compare these two, which are from about the same time. This is 1871 in the domain of chemistry, 
where the periodic table by Mendeleev was a fantastic tool in organizing countless observations in chemistry. This does that with this in these contexts. That does that with this in these contexts. Put those two together, they go boom. Put those two together, nothing happens. All those alchemical and chemical observations made a darn sight more sense when the elements were organized into the periodic table. The columns, the rows all mean something. Adjacency means something. Sure, individual elements have their individual properties, but they don't have those properties in splendid isolation. They have them within this structure. So this is the essence of structuralism now taken from a chemical point of view. We have an organizing of all, a kind of a structure that organizes our observations and allows us to relate them one to the other. That's from 1871. From 1897, we got the first pass of the so-called International Phonetic Alphabet, which was an attempt to or systematically organize all the linguistic contrasts, the sound contrasts, found in the various world's languages, on the assumption that there was a finite number of these, and that one could create, as it were, an alphabet that would work for every language. This was a pipe dream. It doesn't work. It's still done. We still have the International Phonetic Association which is the real meaning of IPA, who generate the International, International Phonetic Alphabet. And it has been expanded. And um, what actually happened was that the, the first attempt at this um, worked very well for most European languages. So the main organizing principles here for the consonants, for example, from left to right is where there is a constriction in the mouth, going from the lips back through the teeth, back to the back of the mouth, and down the throat. <laughs> and then from top to bottom, how that constriction is made, how the air is flowing. Is it flowing through the nose? Is there a sudden burst of release? Of release? Is there turbulence? These are the characteristics by which phoneticians uh, describe sounds, and languages make use of these to um, develop contrasts, which allows us to have categorically distinct words. And this is the 2014 version. There's quite a lot of Still work going on in the less populated areas because this system was originally worked out for European languages. It has a very strong English bias and after that a European bias so that as the scoops, as people have surveyed more and more languages, they've encountered sound systems that just didn't fit nicely into this. Hmm. But the idea is to take the messy, embodied, context-bound exchanges that go on people, among people, and to peel off a layer of something abstract that you can describe in universal tone terms, which is systematic. The emphasis was on descriptive adequacy. A table like that doesn't explain anything, but it allows you to systematize your observations and relate one to another. The Second World War you know, the First World War was only barely a world war, really. It was really a European, North European war, by and large. There was other elements to it, but the Second World War was really the first truly global war. And I mentioned that the military developed a sudden interest in language after that. Not for intellectual reasons, but for practical reasons. If you could develop a theory of language that would allow you to do speech-to-speech -speech translation, you would be better poised to take over the world basically, and that is the origin of many of the departments of linguistics, which were set up in the 1960s. So Chomsky's first really uh, influential work, Syntactic Structures, which grew out of his 55 PhD, introduced the notion of something called transformational grammar. This was a heady intellectual idea which has been dropped. It's been less than left in the dust now, but it was the stuff of uh, French intellectuals, and uh, everyone lo loved the notion, psychologists, psychotherapists. Uh, it was a, the idea was that there were structures in your mind that were deep, and that they then got transformed and moved around and to produce the variety that uh, you produce, sort of what appears to be inexplicably bizarre and varied um, patterns of behavior actually can be explained in terms of deep generative principles, which are much simpler. He'd also produced this critique of Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior. And then I said that um, Chomsky is closely aligned with a 
particular philosopher, which is Jerry Fodor, who introduced a book uh, called The Language of Thought here in the nascent years of cognitive science, which took the theories of generative grammar and more or less claimed this is how our mental economy works. This is not just how language works, this is how thought works. works. We'll come back to this in a little bit. But from the the least from 1960, um, possibly even before, because this, this work itself is built on the computational work of the 40s and 50s. So from the cognitive turn, we find language very, very central to any account of human minds. And we get this gradual replacement of behaviorism as the dominant framework within psychology. No, it's not the only one. The situation is a lot more complicated than that. But we get the, the replacement of behaviorism with something we'll call cognitivism in this culture. The trigger for this was this book, Verbal Behavior, from Skinner, who said that to speak English is to have a set of behaviors that allow you to respond appropriately during an English conversation. Now, I said Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior, was a lot more, uh, a lot richer and more plausible than it seems in the way that we normally view it, which is through the lens of Chomsky's critique. Skinner was, unlike most behaviorists, was acutely aware of context specificity, for example, something which other behaviorists and most cognitivists were not. Um, but clearly, an account of speaking in which utterances are learned responses is in difficulty. Chomsky emphasized the richness of language use, the creativity and generativity, and the fact that we don't merely parrot stuff. And with this, he gave birth to what is modern linguistics. Modern linguistics stems from the late 1950s, and it focuses strongly on syntax. Syntax is the rule-based ordering of symbols in strings such that some sequences are allowed and some are not allowed. This is a fine English sentence. This sentence English not is a, for example. Um, for historical reasons, and we've looked at some of them, this specifically linguistic development became part and parcel of the emerging picture of mind expressed within cognitive psychology, and it was also bound to this extraordinarily rich source of metaphor that arose from the availability of computational theory and computers. Um, there's, but it's, in focusing on Chomsky, we are once more reducing a development spread across hundreds and thousands of people to a few landmark figures, unfortunately. But we have to do that if we just want to remember where we are. Chomsky is very important, but he's by no means the be-all and end-all. However, he's the person to whom one turns when one wishes to define generative linguistics, of which these are sort of the main claims. Language use and acquisition tells us that we're born with an innate readiness to learn and use language. This is the poverty of the stimulus, that the language around you is not enough to account for your learning language. The absolute ease and naturalness with which children acquire language at a very early age, completely differently from the way that you encounter further second and third languages at a higher old age, uh, suggests that there's something built in. And this emphasis on something being built in as opposed to being the product of mere experience and exposure, this is a strongly rationalist concern. This is a concern. So the basic question in the philosophy of minds that was um, that Kant tried to resolve took Descartes' emphasis on logic and reason together with Hume's emphasis on the evidence of the senses and experience and he tried to forge a philosophy of mind that could deal with both. This is strongly Cartesian in its focus on built-in stuff that's not derived directly from experience. There is a puzzle how do you get something that's not derived from experience? If you have ideas, convictions, uh, thoughts that are not derived from your experience, where did they come from? Remember, Hume didn't have Darwin's theory of evolution to go on. Chomsky is leaning heavily on this, on that here, in the hope that brains can change to introduce such a novelty. Now, in order to make this work, Chomsky is not suggesting that there's French brains and Chinese brains and Italian brains and Irish brains. That would be a little too far. So he's suggesting that what, what 
what is part of the biological endowment is this thing called universal grammar that dictates the space of possible languages and that what you're learning as you're exposed to a language as you're growing up is you're selecting among these possible languages. That's a much smaller computational task than learning everything from scratch. Now the universal grammar, to make that such a central feature of your account of what distinguishes humans from the apes. It's interesting, it's not nearly, it's not questioned nearly often enough. This means that to make this approach, anything in this approach coherent, syntax needs to be the essential thing that marks language out. So for Chomsky, language is something very abstract, very universal, and it's systematic. These are the kind of structures grammarians in the Chomsky tradition, in the genitive tradition, deal with. So here we have a bunch of words which together form constituents which have a hierarchical structure, and you can write rules that operate on this structure and transform it in various ways. And the context for this is the view of mind as computer. Um, we need to be cautious because when we reify language, the notion of language in this particular way, we're doing something that has, is as old as history, which is to um, suggest that humans have a specific encapsulated faculty. This is a notion of faculty psychology, that you have certain abilities that sort of exist in glorious isolation. The ability to reason is one such faculty. The ability to use language is another one. Furthermore, as we see in modern linguistics, that faculty of language breaks down into subsystems which are assumed to be more or less independent of one another. So we get the bit that's responsible for the systematic organization of sounds, another bit that's responsible for the systematic organization of words. Um, that particular way of breaking language down may or may not be up to the job, but look at the job that we've given it. If we're trying to, usually when we approach language in the large, is we're looking to tell a story that allows us to distinguish us from other animals. Sometimes it's reason, sometimes it's language, and of course with the birth of cognitive psychology, reason and language come together and are seen as more or less the same thing. Um, with this, we're trying to distinguish something which is characteristic of our species. That's a big ask. Um, we'll see lots of reasons to be uh, un dissatisfied with this notion, but it's historically been a very influential way of doing it. Now Chomsky's approach has changed over the decades. In the 60s and 70s we had this a very um, well-received notion of transformational grammar, which suggested that two sentences that looked the same, so well, well let's convey similar information, so, so I gave John the ball or I gave the ball to John. For example, that seems to be more or less the same information told in two different ways. It was suggested that, well, there'd just be one underlying mental structure for that. And those pieces can be rearranged according to a fixed set of rules to produce either of those two surface variants. Having these rules for reorganizing allowed you to link these two superficially separate sentences and to identify them as uh, derived from a common source. That was very powerful. But it didn't work terribly well as you started to apply it to an awful lot of languages. Too many rules, too many exceptions, none of these glorious universal principles. And so in the 80s and 90s, this approach instead sought to characterize different language systems as being uh, distinguishable from one another by setting a few what are called parameters, or you can think of them as switches. So for example, basic word order in English is subject, verb, object. Um, that's not the case in all languages, but the idea is that there will be a basic word order, that's probably part of universal grammar, and what the child has to pick up on is which of these six possible alternative basic word orders is there, which is a much smaller task in learning that there is such a thing as basic word order. That was the principles and parameters task, it's kind of a minimalism. And this minimalist program has got more and more minimalist 
to recent claims that there is something called the faculty of language narrow conceived, narrowly conceived, which consists in very, very little indeed. In fact, I'd say it's kind of vanished. <laughs> um, so this is the old transformational idea that you have uh, two things. John was kissed by Mary, or Mary kissed John, an active and a passive renditioning, but that they share a common deep structure. The, word, the use of the word deep keeps coming in, and people use it to, to sound really profound. I mentioned that deep learning is the new one, the new kid on the block, right? Well, this is deep structure. Um, this is, this is a, the kind of structures used in transformational grammar, where you would, you would have one canonical word order, and then you'd have transformation rules that allow you to rearrange this. So one, two, five, three would be, she gives me the book, and we drop four, four. So we go from she gives the book to me to she gives me the book. You can see that kind of thing. Principles and parameters, much simpler, minimalist approach. We've got a lot of data coming in from the child's linguistic environment, environment and we probably have some um, universal grammar or um, specific skills. And here a lot of argument goes, how specific are they? Which allow the rapid progression to adult linguistic competence. And exactly what's language specific, what's general purpose, um, that's been hotly debated here. That's the kind of discussion you get into. But then we move into the new millennium and we find this faculty of language narrowly conceived. And in a famous paper by Chomsky, Hauser, and Fitch, they um, made this bold claim that that which is linguistic is this property of recursion. And those of you who have never studied any computer science probably don't know recursion. In order to understand recursion, you first have to understand recursion. Recursion is when you get one thing nested within another thing. So I just said that you can, I can make a longer sentence for any sentence you give me. From a syntactician's point of view, that means I've got a structure S, the sentence, nested within a larger structure S. Right? So I've got a sentence within a sentence within a sentence. It's inception but in language. Okay. That's recursion. And they've claimed that this is what really, this is the, the, the marker of that which distinguishes language from non-language. Um, and since 2005, they've redefined recursion so that this, uh, I can't find anything left in their work. That's me. One of the problems with this is that around the time that they made this bold claim, there was claims by this uh, guy, Dan Everett, about a particular tribe in the Amazon, the Pitaha, whose language apparently doesn't have recursion. And this was embarrassing for the Boston eggheads because now they've just gone so far as to finally, after decades of work, to say recursion is what makes us human, and now they're stuck. Either Dan Everett's telling porky pies, or these people are not really human. And that's an embarrassing position to be in as a Boston linguist. So this was, you wouldn't believe the, the vitriol with which this battle was fought, and is still fought. So there's been an awful lot of condemnation and criticism of Dan Everett's work. Dan Everett's an interesting character. He went over there as part of the SLI school. A lot of what we know about the world's languages has been done by missionaries, Christian missionaries, who run a thing called the Summer Institute of Linguistics, where they go out and try and learn these undocumented languages and stick the Bible down their goddamn throat. Was this the tribe that had like no concept, of, or they didn't have words for... Was it either time or like if you weren't right in front of them, you weren't there? Yes. Short answer, but nobody understood what you just said, so I'll just say it a little bit more. <laughs> the language of the Pitaha is exceptional for very many reasons. Uh, well, it's not that exceptional as you might think. If we compare it simply with English, it has lots of characteristics that, you would, that, are, that seem to us bizarre. If you compare it to language of, of the tribes in the neighborhood, like the Munduruku, for example, it seems a lot less bizarre. But it is kind of an extremum in its simplicity in many respects. There's no counting terms, for example, but that's common in, ma in many languages. We've got, we've got one, two, and then many. People still know how many kids they have, but they don't have words for that particular thing. They do notice if their kids get go missing, or something like that. What was particularly important in the description of the Pitaha is that, um, well, this comes back to what I was saying about the, uh, the Christian missionaries. Dan Everett went out as a Christian missionary to them, and they converted him. 
He gave up being a Christian missionary and became a real goddamn linguist. Um, and they, 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 Peter Ha have several hundreds of years of um, encounter with the Western missionary types, and it's water off a duck's back. They don't give a damn. Um, and it is possible that there is an element in their language that is responsible for their imperviousness to European colonial missionary this, which is that they valorize reports of something you've actually experienced yourself. They are presentists in their very being. They have a word for to come into existence and to go out of existence. And if you come there and you talk to them about the man, man on the moon, they go, well, were you there? And if you're not, they're not going to talk to you about it. They're not interested in it. You know, and they have to be able to, if you weren't there, you have to be able to say, who was there? How do you know? So they establish this chain. They are presentists through and through, and they don't have, really have use for representation in this sense, for talking about things which are um, where you cannot complete the causal chain from the present moment to the thing that happened. That's the, that's the notably weird thing. They also have the simplest kinship system known. They have a, bizarre, a completely bizarre language in many respects. Um, this battle goes on. You think it would be easy to sort out, but it's not easy to sort out. Interestingly, I noticed that in the 1970s there was an Australian Aboriginal language that was documented and someone made a note and said they had no recursion. But at that time it was where the presence or absence of recursion hadn't become this theoretical holy grail that was going to finally explain what made humans human. Human exceptionalism. But then it was at this time. Now, if you want to work with the Pidaha, you can't just go there. There are rules about this kind of thing. Thank God. Well, thank the Brazilian government. It's very, very heavily regulated. Um, the Peter Ha have become the object of intense uh, attention from psychologists and linguists. Um, I th to the best of my knowledge, Dan Edwards' claim holds up. On the other hand, I think the whole discussion has developed an air of the bizarre about it. It says much more about academic politics now than it does um, about humans. Anyway... Modern generative linguistics grew up promising speech-to-speech -speech translation. And that worked fine up until about 1990 when the funding dried up. And then Google solved that problem without any theory. This is true. This is the bizarre thing about modern linguistics is that Generic machine learning methods and the availability of massive databases has solved lots of the problems that had been keeping the funding going in linguistics for years. But it didn't do so with any insight from linguistics whatsoever. So now linguistics is riven and split between people who are happy to learn from big data and develop computational models with lots of numbers. Nobody knows what the numbers mean, but they work. And the phenomenal... Um, progress that's been made here in speech recognition, in automatic translation. I know you all think Google Translate is crap. You have no idea how hard that is. How good! It is incredibly good compared to where, where this stuff is coming from. And the size of the hurdles that had to be overcome for that. But they were not overcome with insights from linguistics. Which is kind of embarrassing for many people. Now there have always been lots and lots of ways to come at the business of language. So cognitive linguistics, which looks at the metaphorical structure of thought, if you like. Embodied linguistics, it looks at the body and the gaze and the eyes and the posture and breathing and so on. Biolinguistics, it looks at the voice as a kind of a biomarker, as a signal and sees continuities with birds and with, with other animals. Now, this is not your linguistic programming. Natural language processing um, which takes texts and tries to figure out meaning, do things like sentiment analysis, conversational analysis, the detailed, minute transcription and, and examination of what's going on between people as they converse, developmental linguistics, neurolinguistics, social linguistics, there's an awful lot of ways to come at language. The way that the discipline, the scientific study of language, developed in the 20th century means that specific formal properties of written sentences, really, have come to be taken as if they were the core of language. That's this bunch here, syntax in the middle. Above syntax, we have something called semantics. You might think of that as a study of meaning, but don't. I'll remove that presupposition. 
Below it, we have morphology, which has to do with how words are made up. Below that, we have phonology, which has to do with the systematic organization of sounds. This is all old structuralist notions. This is all abstract symbols, reified, peeled off from any given communicative situation. Below it, we have the messy business of speaking and hearing, phonetics, which involves tones and spit and such. Above it, we have the business of pragmatics, which is really how which has to do with intentions and purposes and goals. Neither of those can be treated in this abstract symbolic fashion. But that bunch there, semantic, syntax, morphology, and phonology, um, have come to be placed at the heart of the scientific study of language. And different ways of coming at language will pick up, peel off different aspects of this rich and complex behavior. I'm very unhappy with this, but I got my PhD in linguistics. This is where we are. Although by the time my advisor said, you know, Cummins, you really need to take another, sec another course in syntax, I said I quit. He didn't make me take another course in syntax. Um, we need to examine this. We need to know what these various disciplines do a little bit. So what we're going to do is just do a man on a galloping horse tour of the concerns of semantic syntax, morphology, and phonology so that you know roughly where linguistics has been paying attention. And that will serve also to emphasize where linguistics has not been paying attention. So we've got this symbolic bunch here in the middle, bracketed at the bottom in the world of sounds and spit and tongues, phonetics, and at the top in the worlds of real interhuman communication and pragmatics. So we start with pragmatics and we just sort of walk down until we, hit, we um, come back to phonetics. Pragmatics, I, thought I spoke of that as real human communication because language is used in context. And part of the assumption of that central stack is that you can study language irrespective of the context in which it happens. But the most important philosopher of language ever, Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, at least in his later work, emphasized that you, the only way to understand language is to look at how it's used. Where is it used? How are, what effect does it have on the world in a specific context? Pragmatics is very much interested in this. It's interested in intentions. What do people want to do when they're using words? So if I say, can you pass the salt, and you say yes, and you don't pass the salt, you're being a dick. <laughs> That's not playing by the rules, right? We don't know, that, I mean, we don't write down these rules, but to take part in the conversation and interaction is to take part in the game for which we, 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 so we've internalized these rules, but we, even if we don't know them. So pragmatics very much looks at this relationship between the intentions of the participants in a given conversation and the words that they use, and it tries, among other things, to identify the unspoken rules of conversation. And when I say unspoken rules, I shouldn't use the word rule there. That's playing their game, the syntactician's game. There's a nice term, a maxim. Not a man's magazine, but a kind of an unspoken rule or a suggestion, serving suggestion. And behind all this is the notion that when we are conversing, we are cooperating. Even if we're hostile to one another, even if we're in a fight, we are, there's certain kind of framing assumptions that guide us. If you say something, I respond to that. I don't say something completely unrelated. So conversation is a cooperative behavior. And no matter how much at odds we are, the structure of a conversation can be characterized in terms of some rough maxims, which don't have to be followed. But when they're not followed, we're aware of it, and we go, something's going on. So here it's... Rice was the guy who, who listed some of these. So we've got maxims of truth. For example, don't say what you believe to be false. Now, of course you can say what you believe to be false. That's called lying or misleading or misdirection or something like that. It's very easy. There's a hippopotamus in this room. I just said something that was false, but I did it to illustrate a point. There was a point to violating this rule. And if you had to go and really check that everybody meant, as if everyone was taking part in a presidential debate at all times, so you had to fact check everything, you'd get nothing done. I say, is there milk in the fridge? You say yes. I'm not now going to check. I'm going to take your word for it that there's milk in the fridge, right? Because that's how human interaction works. Don't say that for which you lack adequate evidence. If you come in and you say, 
Man, it's raining outside. I'm going to assume you've actually seen that it's raining outside or you've got wet or something. You have some knowledge of that. If you were just making that up, that would be kind of a flagrant violation of one of the normal standards with which we conduct our conversational interactions. Be informative, but not too informative. You all know how that can go wrong. Right? Be relevant. Don't be obscure. Avoid ambiguity. Be brief. Be orderly. You can, you can fla flaunt any one of these. You can violate any one of these maxims, but if you do, it's a signal. Pay attention. If you're deliberately obscure or deliberately ambiguous or overly curt or overly long, it's a signal. It's an important part of your message. Pragmatics is all about trying to understand this relationship between words the intentions of the conversational participants and the context in which something happens. So it's a very human business and it doesn't admit easily of any kind of formalization. But now we're going to enter that weird formal bubble in the middle of modern linguistics with semantics. And the first course I took in semantics as a linguistics student, I was horrified. I'd heard semantics was the study of meaning. And it turned out to be anything but. I couldn't find anything in there that I thought of as meaning. It is the study of some specifically formalizable logical aspects of meaning, and not meaning in the broad sense. Take these two sentences. All Dubliners are not dumb, and not all Dubliners are dumb. Are they the same sentence? Do they mean the same thing, or do they not mean the same thing? In that sense of meaning, semantics is your man. It has to do with the use of these kind of logical quantifiers, all and not and not all, and how they stand with respect to the claim of Dubliners being dumb. If we ask, does the word student and pupil always, do they, are, are those words interchangeable? Do they refer to the same thing? We're asking the kind of question that semantics might use. So we're not talking about the specific instance of an utterance of a term student or an utterance of a term pupil to refer to a specific person in a specific school. We're asking, in general, do they refer to the same thing? Most approaches to semantic use some kind of formal logic. And this kind of structure, for example, these are readily expressible using the typological tools of propositional logic. When we treat of meaning in this way, we're, we've removed ourselves from any particular communicative situation. So this is Parmenidean, it has to do with eternalist stuff and not Heracletian. It doesn't have to do with presentist concerns of a specific context and specific observations. It's abstracted away from that. And then we can ask of words, well, what's the relationship between these two words? Where these words are now elements in a formal system, they're not specific concrete utterances. So we can ask, for example, do the words sofa and couch have the same meaning? Not this utterance of the term sofa, but the word sofa within some kind of system known as English. If so, if they have the same meaning, then they are synonyms. And that's a kind of a, a relationship that we can identify in semantics. We can also identify antonyms, up and down, for not every word has an, has an antonym. What's the opposite of table? There's no opposite of table. Don't say chair. We can, ident we can distinguish between polysemy, for example, um, and hyponymy. In polysemous words, we have multiple senses which are derived from the same root. So the potato crisp that we call a chip, or the Intel Pentium chip in your computer, or the chip you get in the chipper, they're all derived from the same notion, core notion, of a small little fragment taken, hacked off a larger block. Even though they have very specific, distinct senses, they are not accidentally related. But if we look at the senses of the word bank, for example, the institution that deals with your money and steals from you has nothing to do with the side of a river. Those words are not related. They just happen to end up sounding the same. So they have different kinds of relationships. These are, this is a relationship of polysemy, and these are homonyms. So they sound the same, but they're actually different words. Then we have some concepts include other concepts. So the general notion of shape, for example, finds elaboration in the more specific examples of triangle, circle, square, hexagon, and so on. That's a relationship known as hyponymy. So the triangle is a 
open limb of polygon, and polygon is a hypergonal limb of triangle. These are formal relationships which can be expressed mathematically. So you can see this is the kind of meaning that semantics means when it talks of meaning. Completely divorced and removed from any situation of use. Very important. So now we're going to move, go down and drop down from semantics to syntax. This is the heart of modern generative linguistics. This is where the action is. This is where the major theoretical moves were made um, within the Chomsky tradition. The idea is that sequences of words um, can be varied, can be moved around, but not arbitrarily. There are rules within any given language that, allow, that specify what you're allowed, what sequences you're allowed to generate and how you're allowed to transform those sequences. The individual words belong to a few different classes called parts of speech. So you're familiar with nouns and verbs. Here's what Chomsky claimed was, now here's, here's the bizarre way generative linguists think. He claimed this was a meaningless sentence. Colorless green ideas speak furiously. You've all heard that sentence, haven't you? Has, has everyone heard colorless green ideas speak furiously? No? Not everyone. Okay. It was given as a meaningless sentence. I think it's pregnant with meaning. It's as meaningful as any line of poetry I've ever met. I have no problem in using it as a thinking tool and encountering it and deriving a making meaning out of it. But if you look at it as a dead formal structure, perhaps from a semantic point of view, I don't know, maybe it's meaningless. Depends what you mean by meaningless. The words in it fall into different classes. So these are adjectives. This is a noun. This is a verb. This is an adverb. The verb and the adverb go together in the verb phrase. The adjective and the noun go together in the noun phrase, which is recursively embedded within another noun phrase. And this sentence is a conjunction of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And there are various transformations you could do, such that if this is grammatical in English, the resulting transformed sentence would be grammatical as well. So, for example, if this were grammatical, I could transform it into the sentence, um, furiously is how colorless green ideas sleep. And you could do that for any structurally similar sentence. And that's the business of grammar. On this view of language, you can treat the words as if they didn't mean anything. This is strictly formal. It's shuffling symbols around. And there come, there's the link now to the world of computers and information theory and programming languages. Programming languages are actually nothing like natural languages. But Chomsky started off studying programming languages, formal languages and took that and used that as a lens with which to view natural language. And if he had nailed it, then with that we would have unlocked the secret of language and such things as speech-to-speech translation. It would have just been a matter of filling in the details, but that's not what happened. The word grammar in this instance determines which sequences can occur and which can't occur in a given language. So an awful lot of... Um, Work in the grammatical tradition has been done by people in armchairs going, colorless green ideas, sleep furious. And that, that sounds crap. Meaningless, but maybe syntactically okay. Uh, and, and asking yourself this question, is that a sentence of English or is it not a sentence of English? To do that, you don't need to go out and gather an awful lot of data. It's a pretty data poor science. It's strongly conditioned by its original presuppositions. Any science that is committed to such a strong view of the world that you don't actually have to check the world is probably going to be suspect. The rules that move things around is not, are different from the rules that you learnt in school. And there's an interesting question here. Let me put it I, I, on the slide, and now I'm just going to put it very bluntly, which is that natural law, the kind of law that scientists uncover, they do so by studying the world and obtaining regularities, looking at regularities, um, and they don't get to make those laws. No scientist passed the law of gravity, saying thou shalt fall. That's the kind of natural law that grammarians are looking for in language. They're not telling people how to speak. Now, there's this constant confusion because everyone was beaten over the head with grammar books in school and told you're doing it right, you're doing it wrong. You know, if you're studying 
chemicals reacting in a dish. There's no point in standing back and saying you're doing it wrong. Come on, bromine. <laughs> it's not, that's not how language... Decide. So, whether one is on board with the generativist project or not, linguists see themselves as scientists who are studying a natural phenomenon. They don't get to say what's right and what's wrong. This is a constant confusion. A prescriptive approach is suitable for teaching languages. It's suitable for second language instruction. But that's, and, and to that end, sets of rules are created, which are called grammars. So your Latin grammar, for example, is one such thing. And that's different from the attempts of linguists to understand what kind of sentences people are producing, which ones they will produce, which ones they won't produce, and what are the principles that underlie this. As a scientist, anything that people do is valid. It's data. And your job is to abstract away from that. Now, that's very crudely put, but the distinction between a prescriptive approach where you tell people what to do and a descriptive approach where you study a natural phenomenon is a fundamental difference, but the use of the term grammar confuses people and they confuse linguists with language teachers. Linguists are not language teachers. We're in syntax, and we've just gone over this a few times, so here's the, the idea of principles and parameters. So this is the later 1980s, 1990s version that focuses less on reorganizing strings and more on trying to find out what are the basic principles of language. It turns out, for example, it's very hard to invent a language. You can't just string together any old rule and call it a language. People won't be able to learn it and won't have the right properties of language. Anyone name any artificial languages? Well, there's one there, Klingon. Right? Klingon is an artificial language, comes out of Star Trek, has been worked on by very many linguists. Do you remember the uh, big blockbuster movie Avatar? All those big blue space creatures. They spoke a language called Navi. Navi was developed by MIT linguists for that film. Uh, it's very, very hard to get the principles right so that a language is usable. Can anyone think of any other artificial language in this sense? Tolkien. Tolkien has done quite a bit in this, and he was a philologist. Tolkien was very well versed in the principles of grammar as came from the philological tradition. Or Esperanto. Many of you will be aware of Esperanto as an attempt to create a language that was in some sense free of historical and cultural baggage. Good luck with that. No one's ever managed it, but there's been lots and lots of tries. So given that you can't just arbitrarily make up language, you have to do it in the right kind of way. What you're getting at is that you're trying to find the principles of language. So what's the space of possible syntactic rules, for example? And then how do languages differ? And I mentioned this one thing of subject, verb, object, that ordering it's characteristic of English, but it's not characteristic of every language. I think about 40% of the world's languages have this ordering in simple canonical indicative sentences. Sentences like John kicked the ball. John comes first, kicked comes next, and the ball comes last. I think every sentence is capable of making sentences like that, but different languages order these in different ways. Irish orders them differently. It orders it as verb, subject, object. So you would say, kicked John the ball in Irish. Yoda messes with the subject with English by producing so-called English sentences that violate this word order, although he's a little inconsistent in doing it. So I have to be careful. He's not, don't learn your generative grammar from Yoda. But when he says things like, lost the planet, master Obi-Wan has, he's messing with the basic canonical word order of English. Okay, we're not going to pursue this syntactic strand an awful lot further. What we're going to do, we're just going to get down one level below in this symbolic core of modern language structure, which is morphology. And morphology is actually sort of within syntax. It's like the small child of syntax. Syntax has to do with which words can we order. Now, that notion of a word, when you get your head out of your English ass, is a bit more difficult than you would think. Not every language has words. What do you mean not every language has words? Chinese doesn't really have words. Turkish doesn't really have words. Even German. You'd think it was simple, but in English, 
English is a peculiar language in that we don't tend to tack on prefixes and suffixes or infixes to our words to change the meaning an awful lot. The basic elements of meaning in English are very untransparent. The smallest unit that contains meaning we'll call a morpheme. And in some languages, you have a fixed set of words, and sometimes they decompose into morphemes, and sometimes they don't. And in other languages, you're free to generate entirely new words all the time by stringing together new morphemes. Uh, German is of that nature. So in English, for example, the word dog that's just one meaningful. We can't split the meaning up of dog any further. That's one morpheme. Dogs, however, has two morphemes, because there's that bit dog, and there's the plural marker. Doubtful has two morphemes, doubt and full, and you know them both. Doubt can stand on its own. Full occurs in other combinations, like wonderful. There's some odd things here in English. Cranberry. Well, we know berry is familiar from raspberry and strawberry and blueberry and blackberry. What about cran? It's kind of lost there. It exists only in this one word. It's what's called a bound morpheme. So it's still two morphemes, but this one contains a bit of history. It's, we've lost touch with whatever it used to belong to. But then in German, you can do things like make up. I made up this word. It means the woman who cleans the, the gaps in the track on the tram, tram tracks. And you, you're, you can freely string things together. In, in English, we put spaces between them. In German, we don't. That's a large part of the difference is actually on the written page rather than anything that people say. And there it comes in Chinese. You don't have gaps between the words. You just have ideogram, 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 ideogram. Character, 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 character. And there are no gaps between them. So you can't really say what a word is in Chinese. So this notion of a word turns out to be a very English-centered thing. And when we collapse then syntax, which deals with words, with the constituents of words, meaningful constituents of words, we've got this morphology syntax combination. And this gives pause for thought to a lot of psychologists. So if, for example, you are a competent speaker of a language like German or Turkish, um, what do you, do you actually store, remember individual words, or do you remember the pieces that they're made up from? And if it's the pieces in German, because they're so fluid with their word formation, is the same in English? Well, this gives a lot of people a lot to think about. Uh, I'll just mention, to finish up, what a fun business morphology is. Um, if you're investigating the internal structure of words, how do you go about that? What are your tools for in excising and probing and teasing apart? Mm. So if you're um, of a sensitive disposition, you're going to have to cover your ears because I'm going to curse now. There's nothing you can do to stop me. Um, so what you can do is you take a word like fantastic and you uh, put fucking in the middle and you go fan fucking tastic. Sounds okay. Fantastic fucking stick. Uh -uh. As a native speaker of English, you know there's only some ways to break up that word. Uh, and so you get scholarly papers about where you can put fucking in the middle of a word. Uh, it's, it's an empirical tool used for studying words. Language can be a lot more fun than you'd think. We'll stop there, and the next day we'll pick up on the study of phonology, which is still within this bubble. And then we'll